Just before we get started, I do want to say that this video is brought to you by Mack Weldon, the most comfortable daily essential clothes you'll ever wear. Mack Weldon's amazingly comfortable clothing is all made with premium fabrics. You can get 20% off at MacWeldon.com using the promo code BRAINFOOD, one word. So in the video today, we're answering a viewer question because William K asks us, what's it like being an extra in a movie? All right, William, let's crack on. Becoming a background actor, or extra as they are more widely known, is a fairly simple process that usually involves little more than responding to an ad. Depending on the scope of the project and the kinds of extras needed, this ad could appear anywhere from a dedicated website to Craigslist. We even found examples of casting directors using Facebook and Twitter to round up extras quickly in a pinch. For the professional extra, and yes, that is totally a thing, they may even have an agent who helps them book gigs to go and sit, stand, or walk in the background of some scene in a movie for barely more than minimum wage. Of course, if they are a career extra, they tend to be members of SAG-AFTRA and earn a much more respectable amount on the order of around $175 per workday, plus more if a given shoot lasts more than eight hours, which is not uncommon. There are also a slew of other ways that money can be tacked onto a given day's work, like letting the filmmakers use your car in a scene, or maybe bringing your own needed props, like a baby stroller. Similarly, if you're required to do something like smoke or get a certain hair haircut, or wear a substantial amount of makeup, or if there's a delay on a meal break, you get an additional pay bump. It can all add up. On top of this, if you have a special skill, for example, you're decent at tennis and a given scene needs some people competently playing tennis in the background, you can expect a small pay bump for this. For a full list of the many and surprisingly specific ways you can get pay bumps and exact dollar amounts related to that, go read, as we did in all of its glory, sag aftras absolutely riveting 56-page book, Handbook for Performers Working as Background Actors. Moving on from pay, it's almost universally true that food provided on sets is amazing. As one veteran extra, Dawn McHarg, noted of the fare on the set of Iron Man 3, we had anything you could think of. The best steak, shrimp, lobster, and crab. The buffet table, you couldn't see the end of it. That said, as in all things on the set, even when the extra's buffet table looks like something from the most opulent of aristocratic parties, the talent gets the best food of all, and an extra trying to eat from that table is likely to get a swift and occasionally harsh rebuke. As for how hard it is to get a gig as an extra if you're patient and have a flexible schedule, it doesn't seem to be that difficult. What is difficult, though, is getting enough work to make a career out of it, though there are a select few who have managed this. For most, however, it tends to be more of a hobby. For others, they try to use it as a way to break into the industry. However, it's noted this almost universally won't get you far, other than the value in getting to observe the filmmaking process up close and personal. The most important thing about landing a gig as an extra, invariably, is your look. As such, good representative photos are generally needed when applying for a given gig, along with your body measurements and things like that. As different productions have different requirements, what look is being sought out can vary wildly. That said, a running theme is that most films and TV shows are looking for decidedly nondescript looking people to fill out the scenes. The reason being, of course, that a person who stands out in some significant way could prove distracting. Another thing that might get you past over as an extra as if you happen to resemble one of the principal actors. As one pro extra Amy Rogers stated, on Homeland you'll never see them place anyone near Claire Danes who has the same hair color as her. Of course, if you're an established extra with a good reputation and you happen to resemble a given lead actor in various body features and the like, you may ultimately leverage that to being used as a stand-in, the people who are used in place of an actor for the purposes of setting up the scene. The good thing about these gigs is that they pay a whole lot better. If you're talking about a TV show, if you do a good job, it might mean that you've got a regular gig that you can potentially get a steady paycheck from for several years. Going back to people who have a little more, shall we say, unique look, a silver lining of standing out is that you could potentially still be a bit actor as films and TV shows are occasionally in need of people with a specific look. Of course, the problem here is that such casting calls are seldom kind or tactful. They know what they want, and they're looking for someone who doesn't mind unabashedly flaunting what they've got in that way. So, for example, if you're extremely overweight or grotesquely ugly by conventional standards and you want to work in the industry, you're gonna need to get a pretty thick skin. That said, while there are exceptions, this doesn't seem to be much of a problem for the types of people who apply for these roles. As one such individual, Jesse Hyman, noted, 
I'm never going to be the prom king. I'm not going to be the quarterback of the football team. I'm the lovable loser. Maybe you get on the underground over there, or you get on the bus and there's some strange person who you wouldn't want to talk to. I get to play that guy. In this town, even if you're being talked about in a negative way, it's better than not being talked about at all. On the other end of the spectrum, contrary to what you'd expect, being extremely attractive won't usually bolster your chances of scoring a gig as an extra. Again, they don't want someone who will distract the audience who are watching at home. As with all things, though, there are exceptions. For example, a scene in a strip club will likely feature a handful of scantily clad extras of the extremely attractive variety. Again, the running theme here, of course, is horses for courses. Alright, so this all brings us around to what it's like actually being an extra on a set. And in a word, we'd have to say boring. And in three words, we'd have to say mind-numbingly boring. If we wanted to stretch the way to six words, we'd say mind-numbingly boring and occasionally degrading. You see, among the lowest on the hierarchy of a set is almost always the extras. While, as ever, there are plenty of exceptions, with the likes of George Clooney having a reputation of doing his best to combat the poor treatment of extras on set and otherwise embodying the good guy persona, in the general case, though, you can expect to be treated as disposable cattle most of the time. In in regards to the filming process itself, extras like children in a stereotypical British household are expected to be seen and not heard. Beyond it being strictly forbidden to talk to the talent or distract them in any way, even in the off time, in order to keep the various sounds in the film as isolated from other noises as possible, the mics are usually targeted at only recording the voices of the talent. Virtually all background noises are then added in post production. In addition to background chatter, this includes noises that you aren't even expected to notice, like the ruffling of the main character's clothes as they walk, or the clink of a cup being placed down on a table. This is generally one of the more difficult things for extras to get good at, as many people find it unnatural to make silent vocalizations without overcompensating by moving their eyebrows too much, or otherwise trying to use body language to make up for the fact that they aren't making any noise when they're fake talking. To avoid this, beyond being conscientious of body movements, some extras practice nonsense phrases they can repeatedly mouth to one another. For a little added fun, pay attention to the talking extras in the background next time you watch a movie. You can almost always spot the newbies from the veteran pro extras because of things like that. On that note, because most sounds are added in post-production, scenes involving parties, dancing, or cheering crowds are an especially surreal experience for extras, as the set is almost completely silent while filming, other than the talent doing their thing. This poses another unique challenge for extras, as they're required to dance to a song that they can't hear, and they're supposed to be in time with other people who are listening to the same non-existent song. Further, with cheering clouds, extras must be extremely careful not to make any clapping or other such noises when they're supposed to appear very celebratory. For those attached to their phones, it should be noted that smartphones and other devices are largely banned from TV and movie sets, at least when talking about extras. Extras are also generally required to sign non-disclosure agreements right off the bat, barring them from talking about what they saw on the set at all, particularly on social media. Ironically enough, that means this was almost literally the first rule on the set of Fight Club. It's also important to note that a given shoot might easily last 10 to 15 hours. For most of the time, extras are mostly expected to just wait around for someone to tell them what to do. This could mean sitting or standing quietly, sometimes for hours at a time, and at best whispering with other extras, or in many cases, they're required to keep completely silent. When not required to be in a given place, extras generally congregate in some designated area away from the important people, where they can read, chat, play cards, or otherwise find a way to stave off boredom. Beyond being boring, in some cases, the life of an extra can also be extremely uncomfortable. For example, if a scene is supposed to be in the winter, but it's actually the summer and it's 100 degrees outside in balmy Southern California, they'll nonetheless require you to wear appropriate winter clothing and jackets for outdoor scenes, and vice versa in the winter when a scene is supposed to be the summer. Speaking of clothing, while certainly period pieces with large budgets may provide the necessary wardrobe, in most cases extras are required to bring their own clothing appropriate for a given scene. A savvy veteran extra may even bring a suitcase with a variety of clothing just to make sure that they have exactly what's needed in a given scene. Going back to the general case, though, extras are usually expected to wear mostly unremarkable clothing, featuring muted colors that won't stand out on camera. Also important here is that the clothing must be devoid of visible logos or branding. This is mostly due to the fact that showing brands or logos on a screen usually requires someone, somewhere, to sign off on them appearing on the screen. But sometimes it can simply be because the production has a deal with a specific brand or manufacturer. To maintain continuity between shots, extras could, and in most cases, will be expected 
expected to wear the exact same outfit multiple days in a row if a scene takes multiple days to shoot, with some directors going as far as having pictures taken of individuals to ensure that their outfit and hair remains the same between takes. In the end, if you don't mind crappy pay, uncertain and irregular work schedules, long hours of mind-numbing boredom, repetitively doing the same thing over and over again, and generally being treated like something the directors found stuck on the bottom of their shoes, you too can enjoy the benefits of amazing catering and potentially being barely visible in the background of a given scene or movie for a few seconds. Or if you're really lucky, as one John Porter noted of the pinnacle of his background acting career in which he got to play a dead German soldier who the protagonist of the film had killed, it's inevitably the stunt guys who have the fun of actually getting into a fight. The moment they die, however, it becomes the humble extra's job to lie on the ground and play their corpse for the rest of the shots in the scene. So that's what I did for two weeks of my life. I laid on the ground outside in the middle of February playing a corpse in a major motion picture. It was simultaneously the least and most glamorous thing I've ever done in my life. Still, we suppose there are worse ways that you could spend an afternoon than eating phenomenal food while occasionally catching a distant glimpse of Ryan Reynolds, who is of course dreamy. <laughs> They put you put that in the script on purpose. <laughs> Dreamy. Uh, but you know what else is dreamy? The clothes of Mac Weldon. And just before we get into the bonus facts today, I'd like to take a moment to tell you about Mac Weldon. Mac Weldon make the most comfortable daily essential clothes you'll ever wear. They don't just make amazing t-shirts like this. They also make underwear, socks, hoodies, and sweatpants, or as we like to call them across the pond, tracksuit bottoms. Okay, so this t-shirt I'm wearing right now, they say that it is as fresh on day seven as it is on the first day you wear it. And the reviews online, they seem to agree. Full disclosure here, this smells good. This is the first day that I've worn it because I needed to do this in a bit of a rush to make sure the advert gets out on time. But let's just say challenge accepted, Mac Weldon. Challenge accepted. Uh, I'm gonna keep wearing this t-shirt until it smells so bad that I can't wear it anymore. Uh, hit me up on Twitter if you want to see how that goes. I'm uh, at Simon Whistler. Follow along with my smelly adventure. Also, or hopefully not smelly adventure. Seven days without smell. We'll see. Also, they sent me one of these great polos. And get ready for it because people have been asking and I do have legs. And my legs right now, they are wearing these things. They are called radius pants. They're from Mack Weldon. These would be perfect if you want to wear something comfortable. Can you see my head? Can people see my head right now? Sort of. <laughs> I need to duck a little. Uh, these are radius pants. Um, basically, they're extremely comfortable. So if you want to wear something that looks smart to work, but you really want to wear like really comfortable stuff, you could wear these. Uh, I don't need to worry. There's no one here. I could work naked if I want to. But for travel, these are going to be perfect. Look, Mack Weldon is premium men's essentials with smart designs, premium fabrics. They also have a super nice, easy shopping experience. In fact, they're so confident that you will love their stuff that if you don't like something, you get your money back. No questions asked. Not only does it look great, but it performs well too, whether you're working out, working, or just in everyday life. Mack Weldon's making better stuff. It's as simple as that. Don't deny yourself this level of comfort. Even for recording videos, these trousers are better than regular trousers. I'm extremely comfortable right now. You can get 20% off with our promo code BRAINFOOD, one word, at MacWeldon.com. Link in the description below. And let's get into that bonus fact. Because of the high price for paying for a crowd of thousands of extras, for most films and TV shows where such is required, these are almost always digitized audiences or groups of extras that are shot so that they can be overlaid to fill out a stadium. Cardboard cutouts are also commonly used interspersed with real people, though they tend to stand out if the camera is moved during the shot. For these cases, another option available to the director wanting something particularly realistic looking are inflatable extras, which are absolutely a real thing and can be spotted if you watch closely in certain crowd scenes. Just as a fun aside here, I was an extra on the original Captain America movie, and they definitely did that cloning thing. There were a group of us. I think it was a few hundred people in Trafalgar Square, and then they... I don't know if I can talk about this because of that NDA thing. Um... Oh, f*** it. 
Also, fun aside here, back in the day, I was an extra on the original Captain America movie when I was a student, and they definitely did that, like, I was in the scene, like, the celebration after World War II in Trafalgar Square, and they got a group of us together, I think they cloned us to make us fill out the whole of Trafalgar Square. It was pretty cool, but you're kind of dull, yeah. Anyway, as always, thank you very much for watching. Give it a like if you liked it. Check out Mark Weldon, link below, subscribe, all of that good stuff, and I'll see you next time.